it's good to see everybody today, and uh, we're grateful that you're able to be here with us because today is the, the final day of, of the series that we've been looking at throughout the course of the summer. We've been talking about this idea of why not you and what it looks like to really wrestle with our sense of calling and to stop talking ourselves out of the dreams and the desires and the calling that God has placed on our life. And so we've been looking at a variety of scriptures throughout the course of the summer and really wrestling with what calling looks like and what our, our um, understanding of that should be and how that should be applied to our day-to-day lives. And today we're going to be finishing up by just talking about the things that God has given to us to equip us to actually do the calling that he's actually placed upon our life. And so we're going to be wrestling with this thought of what will you do with what God gives you? And before we even look at our scripture, and we're just going to take our scripture a portion at a time. We're going to be in Romans chapter two today. Um, but I just want you to just kind of think about something with me for a second, even before we, we take a look at that. We're just going to take it bits at a time today. But if we took an honest self-assessment of our lives, and I think it's good to do that from time to time, but if we take just an honest self-assessment, thinking about all the different things that, that kind of make up our experience, I think that all of us could probably identify a few areas where we've been blessed with maybe gifts or privileges that other people have not necessarily received. So in your life, maybe some of those privileges relate to where you were born. That can certainly be a uh, a privilege, right? A blessing. Uh, When you were born, what kind of health you've been blessed with, the strength of your your family of origin, meaning, you know, like the idea of the, the strength of the household that you grew up in, your educational opportunities, your your financial blessings, and the, even the ways that you've been privileged spiritually. There's a variety of things that I think we could look at and take an, an honest assessment and identify some areas that we've been blessed with gifts and privileges that not necessarily everybody has received in the same measure that we have received. And so I look at these things and I think, all right, there's certain areas in my life that I think, all right, well, if I want to complain, I could complain and say that area is deficient. I don't really think that that's the area that, or that that's the focus that I should have. I think I should be looking at the ways that the Lord has truly blessed me. And then to wrestle with the question, what am I doing with the gifts and the privileges that I've been blessed with? Instead of focusing on the negative, what, what am I doing with the gifts and the privileges that I have been blessed with? Am I grateful for these things? Am I using these things to bless others? You know, are we, are we basically doing with what God has given to us what he wants us to do with it. One of the saddest things to witness, just when you observe humanity, is the misuse or the devaluation of the blessings and the advantages that the Lord allows certain people to experience. And I think that's something that was a legitimate issue among the the people who claim to have a very special relationship with God during the era in which Paul wrote the book of Romans. And he actually is going to address this in the portion of scripture we're about to to look at. And I just want us to be wrestling with the thought is, are, are we, are we wrestling with the same exact issue today in the context that we live in? Are we wrestling with the very same thing that Paul was addressing in Romans chapter two? where it could be very easy for us to just kind of overlook the blessings we've been given, look past them, and not really make the best use of them. And so today we're just talking about this idea, what will you do with what God gives you? Uh, I'm going to pray for us, and then I'm going to invite you to turn to Romans chapter 2. And again, we're going to look at this a segment at a time. But let me pray first. Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity to be able to come together this morning and to look at your word together and to really think about the ways in which you have blessed us in a variety of ways, the advantages that you've given to us, the unique circumstances that you've blessed us with. And Lord, we know that each of us gathered in this room and, and those joining us via the live stream and those accessing this via the recording afterward, we know, Lord, that we all have different sets of experiences, different ways that, that maybe from a worldly perspective we might look at and say, oh, I feel disadvantaged in this area. But then when we look at things from a spiritual standpoint, we realize, no, you're working all things together for our good and for your glory. And so even the things that at times can look like worldly disadvantages, really from the perspective of eternity, can be major advantages that you've given to us. So Lord, as you've given us these privileges, as you've given us these blessings, as you've gifted us in unique and specific ways, Lord, we pray that we would make the most of these gifts. We pray that we would honor you and that we would really be obedient to you as you've placed a call upon our lives, that we would not waste this calling, that we would not ignore 
this calling, that we would recognize that, that this is a gift from you and that you want us to honor you with everything that you give to us. So, Lord, we pray that these would be the type of things that would be on our mind as we look at your word today. And we thank you for the privilege to be able to look at it together now. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to start us off by looking at Romans chapter 2, starting with verse 12. And as we look at these verses here, the question I want us to be asking is, first of all, will you live out what you claim to believe? So we've been talking about calling. And so if we're going to be obedient to God's calling on our life, that means we need to live something out. So will we live out what we claim to believe? Look at how Paul phrases this in Romans 2, starting with verse 12. He says, for all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness. And their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. Let's pause there for a moment. A little bit of history, if, if you're looking at the Bible, and if you pick up a Bible and you start reading in the beginning section, you'll come across the first five books of the Bible. And the first five books of the Bible, the books of Genesis through Deuteronomy, are typically referred to as the law, or sometimes they're called the law of Moses. And in the content of those books, you see God revealing more about his holiness and more about the standards for living that he expected the Jewish people to live by. Now, when we fast forward to Christ coming to this earth, Christ came to this earth to actually fulfill and keep the law of the old covenant perfectly for us because by nature, we were never able to keep it. Even though the law was perfectly holy, we're all guilty of breaking it, as were the Jewish people. But it appears, as Paul's writing these words out, that some of the Jewish people of his time mistakenly believed that they were doing a good job keeping the law, even without the help of Christ which really doesn't make sense biblically when you look at the purpose for which the law was given. It was actually given to us to demonstrate the holiness of God and to also show to us why we needed Christ to keep it for us. Now, the Gentile nations that Paul's referencing here, and we'll be a little theological here at the beginning to set up what we're looking at, but the Gentile nations, they were largely ignorant of God's law. And that's not a big surprise because generally speaking, they didn't have access to it. And they weren't necessarily aware of it. But as a matter of conscience, Paul pointed out that some Gentiles were actually living like practitioners of the law, even without knowing the particulars, which is kind of amazing when you think about it. And I believe that that happened as the Holy Spirit spoke to their consciences and pointed them in the direction of truth. I believe the Holy Spirit does that today as well. He points us in the direction of truth. And we also know that the requirements of the law... When you think about it, you know, I don't know if you've read through the first five books of the Bible, Genesis through Deuteronomy, but if you want to summarize the requirements of the law, they can actually be summarized rather simply. It's actually helpful even before you read those five books to have this summary in the back of your mind. Those who were under the law were called to do two things, love God and love one another. You can summarize the entire law with loving God and loving one another. And Jesus made a point to explain that, actually, when you look at Matthew 22. Now, I don't know how well you could read that, but I'll read it for us. In Matthew 22, starting with verse 34, Jesus said this, or the scripture says this, and it quotes Jesus. It says, but when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Now, let me just pause there at verse 35. Anyone a lawyer? I'm not going to pick on lawyers too bad. All right, no one's a lawyer? Oh, well, then I could pick on them all I want if, no, if we don't have a law. But one of the things that lawyers are really good at, also teenagers are really good at. Uh, I remember when I was a teenager, I used to think to myself, I should be a lawyer. Because I would talk myself out of many a trouble. But they're good at kind of like finessing statements and trying to like pick somebody apart by their words, right? And so here it says, and one of them... So that like, and just think of this, like this, this smug guy looking at Jesus and thinking, I'm going to trick him. 
I'm going to trick him into saying something that he doesn't exactly want to say, and then we're all going to look at him like a court of law and say, guilty. That was the goal. That's what this guy was trying to do. So it says, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. What he's saying, the whole Old Testament, it depends on loving God and loving other people. That's how Jesus summarized it. And that remains God's calling on our lives. For you, for me, for all of us, love God love one another. We're called to love him with our whole heart, not just giving God a a box somewhere, not just giving God a compartment somewhere. And we're to love one another like we love and like we care for ourselves. And when we start to veer off course from what Jesus explained to us in Matthew chapter 22 and from, from what the entire Old Testament, according to Jesus, was trying to help our hearts to understand, we start to veer off that course We're called to listen to the guiding counsel of the Holy Spirit who will speak to our conscience and who will help us. And we're also called to know that there is going to come a day when God will judge our secret lives and our secret thoughts by Christ Jesus as Romans 2.16, which we just read a few moments ago, actually tells us. It says, on that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. So if we claim to have faith in Christ, and if we claim to believe the teaching of his word, my question for us is, will we actually choose to live out what we claim to believe? Because there are many people in this world who have great doctrine that they don't put into practice. And that was the challenge that Paul was actually laying down for those who had grown up in Judaism, and who apparently at this point seemed overconfident very self-confident in their, in their personal merits. They thought that they didn't need Jesus that much, or maybe at all. They thought that they could keep these requirements without his help. And I think that that's a challenge we should take to heart as well, because we've been blessed with even more spiritual privileges than they were, and yet sometimes we act like we don't need Jesus all that much. I, I have to confess to you that one of the things that the Lord really convicted me about my walk with him when I was in my early 20s is that I was trying to do way too much of this Christian life in my own strength. I was, treating, I was treating salvation like it was a matter of Jesus getting me started, and then I will take it from here. And what Paul was trying to say to the church at Rome, and what he's teaching us as we look at these words today, is that it doesn't work that way. You need Jesus as much today as you did on the day when you first met him. That never, ever changes. Now, think about the blessings that you and I have received living in this era. It's greater blessings than those that have come before us, particularly those that lived under the old covenant, because we live after Christ's crucifixion and after Christ's resurrection. And being that we live in this era, Scripture reveals to us that as we trust in Jesus Christ, we're also indwelled with and gifted by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, he blesses us and works in us in a different way than than people experienced during the Old Covenant era. We also live in an era where the Lord's caused his church to grow. And he's caused his church to spread all throughout the world. And here's another thing that's a real blessing, and this is huge. We have access to the completed canon of Scripture. I was looking at a video the other day that was taking you on a tour of a Bible Antiquities Museum. And in that museum, they were showing how they had preserved different fragments of Scripture uh, and how there were, it was also taking you through the history of how people were persecuted for actually translating the Bible into the common languages that were spoken by, uh, you know, just the populace in general. And we look at that and we have, I mean, I, I can't even tell you how many Bibles I own at this point. I bought a new Bible two weeks ago. And you know why I bought that, that Bible? Two weeks ago, I bought a new Bible. I already have 40. I really think that's the actual number. I think I have 40. I counted the one day, and I was like, I have 40 Bibles. I didn't realize I had that many Bibles. So why did I buy a new one? I already have one, right? Plus, it's on the Internet, and I have a smartphone in my pocket all the time, right? You know, I bought a new one. 
I wanted a, a new sitting down Bible. So I have a Bible, I guess, for every posture, you know? This is my standing Bible. This is my smartphone Bible. Now I wanted a good sitting down Bible. I thought, you know, I want one that just lays nicely when I'm sitting in, in, in the family room and drinking a cup of coffee or a cup of tea. I want one that sits nicely on my lap because the one I've been using, I didn't, it just didn't, it wasn't sitting very nicely. And I was like, I want one that sits nicer. And I found a really good one. And so I bought it. So now I have 41, right? 41 Bibles. We live in an era where we have access to Scripture like no other era has ever had. I mean, can you imagine? You'd have to be the richest person on earth a a thousand years ago to have 41 copies of the Scripture. You know, you were fortunate if your town had a copy. And they used to chain it if there was like a a chapel or so, and you had copies of it, they would chain it to the building because they were afraid someone might steal it. But here's the thing half the people couldn't read it, and half of them, it wasn't even in your language. So what happened? Well, people start believing a whole bunch of ridiculous superstitions, superstitions and things like that because they weren't actually able to access the Scripture and read Scripture, and they got further and further and further away from the Gospel, and your life and my life is exactly the same. If you're just depending on somebody else to tell you about the Bible but not actually spending a lot of time in the Bible, your life will drift further and further and further from the Gospel. It's historically verifiable. That's exactly what happened. People got further and further and further from the teaching of the gospel to the point where when they heard it fresh again, they were, it sounded like brand new information and they should have already known it. And here you have the apostle Paul, like, you know, really, I think, forcing us to wrestle with thinking about the ways we've been truly blessed. And he, here he's basically talking about, you know, if, if those who came before us had no excuse for failing to live out what they claimed to believe, That's even more true for us. We have no excuse for failing to live out what we claim to believe. Now, thankfully, we're we're blessed with the indwelling power of Jesus Christ to walk with us with the kind of integrity that ultimately only he can foster. Love what it tells us in Hebrews 13, verse 18. There, the writer of Hebrews says, Pray for us, for we are sure that we have a clear conscience desiring to act honorably in all things. A clear conscience, desiring to act honorably in all things. That's something Christ fosters within us. But maybe you've heard all of this before. Maybe this is not new information for you. Maybe maybe you're so familiar with it that you think, you know, I'm so familiar with that that I could even teach that to others. That's great. And we want that to be the case. But here's the thing. Are you also willing to learn what you claim to be able to teach? Because that's the follow-up question that the Apostle Paul addresses here in the, in the coming verses. Will you learn what you claim to be able to teach? Look at what he says when you get into verse 17 down to verse 24 of Romans 2. He says, but if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and approve what is excellent because you are instructed by, from the law, And if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, dishonor God by breaking the law. For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Do you ever get a letter in the mail? I mean, back in the day when people still wrote those. Um, Most letters are very, uh, like, chipper and, like, upbeat, right? Paul's writing this as a letter to to the church at Rome, and these are very confrontational words, right? This is very, I got something in the mail the other day. It made me happy. I don't know what the initial reaction of the church at Rome was when they read this, but Paul really, I mean, he, the, the sarcasm here is pretty thick, isn't it? He's like, you who claim to be able to, to, to know all this, do you actually practice this, right? Years ago when I was a relatively new pastor, I think I've shared this before because it's something that actually had a big impact on me. But I was a, a relatively new pastor, and I was actually invited to attend a training seminar that focused on church health and community outreach. Those are two things that are very important. I think all church leaders should go through training like that or read books on those subjects, church health, community outreach. 
certainly a valuable thing. And I, I was excited to go, and I actually asked another pastor. He was a seasoned pastor. And I asked him if he was planning to attend as well, sort of assuming that he probably was because the training was being put on free and it was being put near where both of us lived. And and I also happened to know that at the time his church was really, really struggling. And to be perfectly candid with you and perfectly honest with you, his track record in leadership wasn't necessarily the best. But he told me he would not be uh, attending the training event. That's what he said. I will not be attending that. And in my mind, I'm like, why will you not be attending that? It's free. You were invited to go just like I was invited to go. And I also knew he had the time. It wasn't like there was a conflict of interest. He actually had the time. And in fact, he followed up the conversation by revealing why he wasn't going to attend the training event. He said this, I have attended so many of these things, I could teach them now. That's what he said to me. I've attended so many of these things, I could teach them now. Now, I know I've told you that story at least somewhere along the line, but it was actually something that was, I believe, something the Lord wanted me to see and experience early in my ministry because I remember finding it very disturbing as he said that. And I thought to myself, and even I I believe in that moment I prayed, Lord, please help me not to harden my heart like this someday. Because he seemed so jaded. His comment was, I've attended so many of these things, I could teach them now. And I remember thinking at that time, maybe you could, but it's a shame you're not putting into practice what you claim to be able to teach. Now, I didn't have the bravery to actually say that in that moment, right? It probably would have been disrespectful if I said it in the particular context. But I just remember thinking to myself, well, if you know it so well, why don't you do it? But I think I understood, because pride gets in the way of us being teachable, doesn't it? And I've got my areas of pride. I'm sure you've got your areas of pride. It's a real struggle for us. And that was an area where I saw another brother in Christian leadership really sabotage an opportunity that the Lord was blessing him with. And when you look at this portion of God's word, I have a very similar feeling toward the the actions Paul was describing in these verses here. Because you have Paul who, by the way, he grew up in a Jewish context. He had a strong affinity for the Jewish people. He loved them deeply. He wanted them to experience the spiritual awakening that he had been graced to experience by Jesus. And in fact, when we read the scriptures, we could see that God had chosen the Jews to experience a myriad of spiritual blessings and a myriad of cultural blessings, including the fact that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to this earth as one who would be born a Jew. But as we could see from this chapter in Romans, it's very possible to become kind of cocky about the blessings that you've received instead of humbly grateful for them and just say, Lord, thank you. What do you want me to do with this? Because this is a huge advantage you've given to me. And I think it's also possible, which is really strange to say, but I'll tell you what I'm getting at here in a second. I think it's very possible for people to become experts in scripture without actually connecting the knowledge that you've stored in your head with your heart and with your hands. I think we could stuff a whole bunch of information in our head and not actually emotionally react to it or live it out or apply it in our day-to-day life. And I remember thinking this when I was in Bible college in particular. Kind of, I don't know what I thought going to Bible college was going to be like. Now, first of all, it was a good experience, but it wasn't a perfect experience. I almost thought, those of you that have gone to the same college I went to, you're going to think this is funny. But I, I wasn't even, I was not planning to go to college. I had zero intention of going to college right up until the very like last couple months of high school. My intention was to go into business. I remember saying to my dad, I was like, Dad, here's the deal. Why do I want to take on a whole bunch of debt? I remember actually, how about these numbers? I said to him, it's like, Dad, why would I want to take on $40,000 in debt to go to college for four years? By the way, $40,000 to go to college for four years. Slight, that's increased a little bit, right? But I remember saying, I was like, Dad, why would I want to borrow $40,000 to go to college for four years when my intention is to, and I had my business plans all lined out for them, and they're actually halfway decent business plans. In our family, we owned a grocery store, and so I was surrounded by entrepreneurs. I was like, why do I need to go into debt to get an education to do something I'm not even going to do? And he's like, well, I think you should still go. And I was like, you got to give me a better reason than that. He should have just said, you'll meet your wife. That's what he should have said. He should have just said, there's girls there. That's what he should have said. I would have been like, you know what? You make a good point. But I thought when I went to college, it was right at the end. Right at the end of high school, I realized, you know what? I love teaching. And I started to get in my head. I was like, you know, I think I want to be a history teacher. Well, I better go to college. But if I go to college, I want it to be a Bible college. I want to get that history degree, but I want to be in a Bible context. Because you know what I wanted that to be like? I thought it was going to be like heaven on earth. 
I grew up going to a public school. Most of my friends did not love Jesus. I had, I had some friends in my day-to-day life that loved Jesus, but not most. Uh, plenty of people in my life that, that really kind of got on my case about the fact that I loved Jesus. And I thought going to Bible college was really going to be like four years of living in heaven on earth. That's what I really thought it was going to be like. And I came to college wide-eyed, expecting everybody to take their, their faith in Christ super, super seriously. And what I discovered was there are some people there that did. And there were also some people there that did not. And it also amazed me as I went through four years of study in that context, and it seemed very tragic to me that I had classmates that they actually have four-year Bible degrees. But you would never know that by looking at their lives. You would never know that they spent four years of their life studying the ins and the outs of what Scripture says. Because as far as I can tell, they don't put very much of it into practice, and they don't seem to make Jesus very much a priority. So that's what I mean when I say, and that's what I think Paul's even getting at here when he's he's saying, all right, you claim to know this stuff. Do you actually live it out? You you, You think it's in your head. Okay, well, is it also in your heart? Does it also come out in your hands? Are you willing to apply this when you speak to your spouse or your children? Do the people that you interact with on a day-to-day basis get even a hint of the fact that the Holy Spirit is transforming you and producing holiness in your life? One of the most tragic aspects about becoming unteachable, particularly when it comes to the truth of God, is the negative impact it could actually have on unbelievers who may be observing God's people. Paul poses the question like this, the way he says it in verse 21. He says, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you not, or excuse me, do you commit adultery? Now, are those questions we might benefit from asking ourselves? Yes. Because I think it exposes areas of our life that maybe we don't want exposed. And it's trying to help us see these things. And I think that we could certainly pick on the shortcomings of other people. I find that much easier than picking on my own shortcomings, right? And you probably do too. But wouldn't it be more beneficial for us to wrestle with those questions and start asking ourselves the tough stuff instead of picking on other people all the time? Christ desires humility among his people. And he wants that to be a reflection of his heart, and he wants that to be a reflection of his example. And with humility comes something else. You know what comes with humility, true humility? teachability. They go hand in hand. Humility and teachability go hand in hand. We can claim to be know-it-alls if we choose, but who benefits from that? Nobody benefits from that, right? We can claim to be able to teach every side of every issue Jesus ever communicated, but are we willing to sit down and stop talking for five minutes and listen to the counsel of his spirit as he seeks to apply the teaching of his word to our own hearts? Will we humbly listen to what we claim to be able to teach? And with that in mind, please notice one additional thing about the subjects that Paul addresses in the second half here of Romans chapter 2. He scrapes around in the recesses of our hearts and with the examples he uses, he invites us to ask if we're willing to, to, to finally seek the praise of God over the praise of men. Look at how he, how he finishes up this section here. Read with me from verse 25 down to verse 29. He says, For circumcision, indeed, is of value if you obey the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. So if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have the written code and circumcision but break the law. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly. And circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. Now think about what Paul said there in those verses. Just think about it from a theological standpoint for just a second. When you read through the Old Testament, when you look through the Old Testament law, the covenantal sign that the Jewish people were given by God as a visible symbol of his unique relationship with them was circumcision. That was the sign. So on the eighth day, after a male child was born, he was to be circumcised. And that was to serve as a sign of the covenant that God had made with that group of people. 
And now in our day and age, in a very similar way, we've been given baptism as a visible testimony of our relationship with God under the new covenant through Jesus Christ. So there's correlation between those signs or those symbols. But does the act of circumcision or does the act of baptism guarantee the salvation of a soul? Can just physically being dunked in water or physically being circumcised save a soul, even though those are meant to be signs of what the Lord is doing in this generation? No, those things don't save anybody. Salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. The removal of a foreskin does not save a soul. Neither does being immersed in water. The point of these symbols, when you look at what Scripture reveals to us, is to testify visibly to something spiritual that the Lord is doing inwardly. So is anyone going to be able to come before the Lord someday and brag about their circumcision as if that's going to impress him? Do you think that's going to impress the Lord? And by the way, I'm asking this because that's exactly what the people Paul was was speaking to were basically doing. They were bragging to one another, like, I'm circumcised, I'm fine. I'm fine with God, I've been circumcised. So what's the difference between that and coming before God and being like, God, guess what, I'm circumcised. What do you think God's going to do? whoop de do. What do you want, like a parade? That was a decision made for you in most cases, right? Does that give us excuse for boasting to one another? How about baptism, right? We just brag to each other, hey, I'm baptized. You're not, oh, you didn't get baptized. Okay. Baptism's important. Absolutely. But it doesn't save you. It testifies to the salvation that Christ has given to you. And he gives it to you as a gift of his grace by faith. But here you have a group of people who are effectively bragging about signs of a covenant instead of recognizing that a relationship with God is initiated by faith. Their faith was in a ceremony. Their faith was in a tradition instead of in the Lord who was pleading with them to see that salvation is found in no other name other than the name of Jesus Christ. Just like it says in Acts 4.12, it says, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved, other than the name of Jesus Christ. It's just Jesus. So when we trust in Jesus, what does he do? Well, he not only changes our heart, but he gives us a brand new heart. Gives us a brand new one. That's what Paul was getting at when he said, But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. So when the Lord gives us a new heart, what happens? We no longer live for the praise of men. We live for Christ's praise. We live for Christ's glory. We learn to care about what matters to him. His desires become our priorities. His approval is what we seek. We start to rejoice in the confidence that, that the love God the Father has for God the Son is love that we will forever experience because we are counted as righteous in Christ, the one in whom we've trusted. The righteousness of Christ is given to you as a gift as you trust in him. It's a dangerous thing to live for the praise of men. And in the end, it'll only leave us with regret and it'll only leave us with sorrow. But when you look at what the scripture tells us, it reveals to us that living by faith in Christ for the glory of Christ with his honor on our minds, that results in a life of joy that is not diminished by changing circumstances. And this is what Paul was praying that his Jewish brothers and sisters would one day experience. And it's likewise the very thing that Christ desires that you and I experience as well. Last week, uh, you know, we, we live in the era right now where everybody's doing a live stream, right? I'll mention this as we finish up. So I think about this. Um, You know, what are you doing with what God has given you? So last week we were also even talking about the fact that the Lord's given us a voice. You know what I often think in, in my role as pastor? I often wonder when the last time in my life I'll ever be able to preach will be and what I'll say. Is that a weird cryptic thing to think about? I actually think about that from time to time. I think, because the last time I preach, I'm not going to know it's the last time I'm preaching, right? I've thought about that for many years. Well, last week, a friend of mine, uh, he was preaching. He was, um, was 
via live stream. And uh, he was doing what he could with what God had given him. And he got about 20 minutes into his message, and he said, you know what, I'm going to have to pause there because I'm starting to get confused. And it was a very abrupt way to end his message. He said, I'm starting to get confused here, and I don't want to preach from a, from a, a spot of confusion, so I'm going to end the message now, and we'll pick up right here next week. And he passed away this week. And I, I thought to myself, I reviewed it because it's online. I was sitting down with my wife and watching it last night. And I was like, you know, he, he didn't know that was, the last, this, that was the last moment. That's the last thing. That was his last moment. All he knew is that something was going on. He could sense that something was going on in his body, and his mind wasn't acting right. And he said, I, I got to pause here. I'm getting confused. And that was the last time. That was the finale. There was no next week, right? There was no today. He thought he was going to be speaking today. There was no today. He's with the Lord now. So I look at stuff like that, and I think to myself, okay, Lord, what advantages, what blessings, what privileges have you given me? I don't know how much time I have. I just know what you've blessed me with. Am I sitting on it? Or am I answering your call? Am I doing what you've called me to do? Or am I just wasting time? And I don't want to waste time. And I don't want you to waste time either. As Christ has equipped you, as Christ has called you, Live with the story of my friend, my friend Dennis, who just passed away the other day. Live with his story in your mind, because that's the same story for all of us. You don't know when that day is up. And like Paul mentioned in the scripture, then, you, then we come before the Lord, right? And everything's going to be laid bare. And what we did with what he blessed us with, we then give an account. So let's live as men and women who are ready to give that account. Not wasting time. Answering his call, saying yes, and then using the gifts and the blessings and the privileges and the advantages that he's given us. Will we live out what we claim to believe? Will we learn what we claim to be able to teach? Will we seek the praise of God over the praise of men? What will we do with the many significant blessings that we've already been given? Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word and for the privilege that it is to be able to look at it. And even for the privilege that it's been over the course of the summer months here to be able to look at this idea of calling and to just wrestle with it and think about it. Lord, you've, you've placed a calling on our life. You've gifted us. You've equipped us. You've drawn us unto yourself. And that's no small thing. You've accomplished this through your son, Jesus Christ. And we're just so grateful, Lord, that we can be considered part of your family. And, Lord, we know that we're given a really, really brief time here during this life. You've given us every advantage we need. We have all we need in you. We may not have every worldly advantage we'd like to have, but we, have, we truly do have everything we actually need. If we have your son, Jesus Christ, the one through whom creation was spoken into existence, the one who sustains creation, if we have Jesus... We really do have everything we need. So, Lord, help us not to approach life like we're lacking something. Help us not to approach life like there's something that we need that we don't have. We already have what we need. So we pray, Lord, that by your grace we would do with what you've blessed us with, what you've called us to do with it. Lord, it's so wonderful to be part of your kingdom. It's so wonderful to be part of your family and to even think that you would condescend to, to intervene into to lives like ours. We don't deserve your blessings. We don't deserve your goodness. Your word tells us we were living as your enemies. And yet you, you stooped to reach into the life of your enemies and to bless them and turn them into your friends and your family. Lord, what a gift that is. So, Lord, as your child, I, I want to live out the things that Paul was challenging us to live out. Lord, as a church family, we want to live out the things that Paul was challenging us to live out. We don't want to be people who just stuff our heads full of information, but it never reaches our hearts and it never reaches our hands. Lord, we don't want to be the type of people that have heads full of knowledge, but do not have a reputation of demonstrating the love and grace of your son, Jesus Christ, to our neighbor. 
Lord, it's just so wonderful to be able to look at these things today and be stirred up by them. I know I, I can't help but be stirred up by looking at this portion of your word, Lord. It really does fire me up, and I pray that it does that for all of us, because your spirit brings these things to our mind, and I believe your spirit will bring these things to our mind long beyond today when we need that pep talk or when we need that reminder and when we need to think about these things once again. So, Lord, thank you so much for this blessing. Thank you for the privilege to be able to start off our week together looking at these things. And, Lord, by your grace, we pray that we would put your will first. We pray that we would be obedient to your leading and to your calling. And we pray, Lord, that going forward, we wouldn't just go through life like we're just wandering without some purpose to our existence. We pray that we would understand on a deeper level the nature of the calling that you've given to us. And the scriptures that we've had the privilege over the course of this summer to be looking at, we pray that you bring them back to our minds and that you'd help help us to live them out, help us to model them in our household and to our children, and help us to glorify you in the process and to live for your glory, not for the praise of men. We love you, Lord. We thank you for your blessings, and we thank you for just the the privilege to be able to, to be part of your family. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.